During a Nintendo Direct on June 21st, 2023, a mostly simple and unassuming trailer for Super Mario RPG ran 12 minutes into the show. While it was a quintessentially Nintendo-looking game, and likely unremarkable for most people watching, for many, it was just the opposite. For those who understood the backstory behind just how unlikely this type of remake was to happen, it was a jaw-dropping and utterly shocking thing to see. To understand why a full-fledged remake of a lesser-known game in a multi-million dollar franchise is the most unlikely thing to witness, we have to start at the top of the pipe and explain the original. Released in March of 1996, Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars was the final Mario game made for the Super Nintendo. It was a break from tradition for the mustachioed plumber and was full of a list of firsts. For instance, instead of being a platformer, it was a turn-based RPG with limited amounts of jumping. The graphics were pseudo-3D, being made of pre-rendered sprites created from high-quality 3D models, and it had a major focus on story. That last one was by far the most impactful, as Mario continuously emoted with various familiar faces from the franchise, along with new friends he found along the way, who would regularly talk back to him. As a whole, it stood as a beautiful game from the latter days of Super Nintendo releases, but more importantly, its story and world were far more fleshed out than anything that had ever been seen in a Mario game before. Overall, it had a significantly different feeling to all other games featuring the iconic plumber, which in part led it to receiving a slew of positive scores from review outlets at the time. Yet, the game was mostly eclipsed by the release of the far more influential Super Mario 64 that was released on the brand new Nintendo 64 a mere three months later. This led Super Mario RPG to become a sort of sleeper hit and develop a cult following among the people who managed to even learn of its existence in the shadow of a much bigger game starring the same character. That's the short version of the game's history. But remember, we're here to talk about why a remake is so unlikely, and a big part of that is why this game was ever made to begin with. The pipe dream still hasn't begun to even get complicated yet. In early 1994, during a business meeting between the executives of Nintendo and Square, Shigeru Miyamoto, the creator of the Mario franchise, brought up the idea of somehow putting Nintendo's iconic plumber in an RPG. Square was known for the Final Fantasy series, so RPGs were very much their expertise. The logic was, why not just put the two best things from the separate companies together in a collaboration? What followed was essentially Nintendo giving their first-party IP directly to Square so they could run free to create an RPG. What's more, they were only ever checked in on to make certain Nintendo, or more specifically Shigeru Miyamoto, was satisfied with the direction of the project. According to Super Mario RPG's director, Shihiro Fujioka, they were seldom ever told they did things wrong. Instead, they were more frequently told certain things needed to change or to augment existing ideas and designs to make them more in line with what Mario should be like. In essence, the very reason Super Mario RPG came to be the cult classic it's known as is because Nintendo took a hands-off approach to the game's development. This led to it having a far more square flavor of design and writing, which in turn set it apart from all other Mario games. After all, Super Mario RPG came out a whole three months before Super Mario 64, and the two had no overlap between development teams since they were made by totally different companies. The Mario games never had much in the line of story or world building either. 
This meant that Square had to create an entire landscape and populate it with denizens that felt like they fit with Mario and what little was known about the world he lived in. In short, there was an amazing amount of creative agency given to the team at Square to create things with the official Mario property before Nintendo even built their own canon that's recognizable to this day. Remember, they were doing this while the now famous Peach's Castle was being made, before anyone had ever even seen it. All of this was an enormous and implicit exercise in trust between the two companies. But again, we're here to talk about why a remake was so jaw-droppingly unlikely. And the pipe dream is about to get messy. To fully understand why a remake of Super Mario RPG was so unlikely for so long, and why having one actually happen represents a turning point in the relationship between Nintendo and Square Enix, we have to learn about Final Fantasy VII and how it began the Nintendo Square feud. For roughly the first decade of Square's existence, from 1985 to 1996, they almost exclusively produced games for Nintendo hardware. That wasn't entirely by choice, but they became a major third-party developer that helped to establish Nintendo's dominance in console gaming with the Nintendo Entertainment System and Super Nintendo. In the early days, Nintendo maintained stringent control over what games were allowed on their hardware and how the physical games were produced. Over time, though, those draconian rules fell away, yet Square voluntarily chose to continue to only release their games on Nintendo systems. This led the two companies to have a close relationship, which, as already covered, was a big part of why Super Mario RPG came to exist. However, during its development, the shift from two-dimensional to three-dimensional graphics was taking place in the industry. Sony had already put out their own console, the PlayStation, in late 1994. Nintendo was partially responsible for this competition even existing, as the PlayStation was the final product of a failed hardware deal between Sony and Nintendo. So, it was during the late stage of the two-dimensional graphics era that Nintendo began to show developers what would be their competing next-gen console, the Nintendo 64. The developers at Square, who were gearing up to create the now famous Final Fantasy VII, naturally thought that they would be putting it on Nintendo hardware. This is when things went awry, though. For a myriad of technical and economic reasons, it became clear that the Nintendo 64 hardware wasn't going to cut it for what they wanted Final Fantasy VII to be, or any other software going forward. At the same time, Sony was performing robust outreach to multiple developers, working hard to bring software to their new, unproven platform. For nearly the same technical and economic reasons that the Nintendo 64 wouldn't work for making Final Fantasy VII, the PlayStation would work. The move just made sense, and Square was running parallel tests on both systems before they decided to switch to the PlayStation. This is where the details and timeline get a little bit hazy, but according to a 2017 Polygon article that sources the words of more than 30 of the original developers who made Final Fantasy VII, the president of Square called a meeting and told everyone they were giving up on Nintendo and switching to Sony. This came as an enormous shock to many people inside the company, but to make matters worse, it appears that this decision was not communicated to Nintendo in a professional manner. According to the same 2017 article, several Square employees recall announcing the switch from Nintendo to PlayStation in television and magazine advertisements. I can't verify the veracity of this particular story, but many of the employees from Square had various anecdotes of how, after Square partnered with Sony, they weren't allowed near Nintendo offices for five to ten years. 
And it is true that after the release of Super Mario RPG, Square didn't make any games on Nintendo systems for about six years. The most notable words allegedly said by Nintendo that sums up how bad the falling out was were, if you're leaving us, never come back. That would be bad enough as is, but to make matters worse, Square went further and convinced other companies, including their primary rival, Enix, whom they later merged with, to also switch from Nintendo to Sony. In totality, Square didn't just leave Nintendo, they also burnt the bridge after they crossed it to get out. That's not to say Nintendo wasn't engaging in their own unpleasant behavior around the same time, though. In 1996, after the success of the NES and the SNES, Nintendo owned a large portion of the video game market, and they flexed that muscle frequently. We're getting off track, though. The point is that, for all of these reasons, it took roughly six years before the two companies began to work together again. A lot of it is likely associated with how Nintendo had a change in leadership at the time, with Satoru Iwata taking the helm of the company in 2002 which was a year before Square's first game back on Nintendo hardware. It wasn't full force, though, as everything was limited to Final Fantasy spin-off games for handhelds, like the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS. For whatever reason, there just didn't seem to be an appetite for putting any games on Nintendo's flagship consoles. So, to sum up, the creator of Mario approaches Square to make an RPG based on the franchise. Square accepts and creates an entire Mario universe whole cloth, with towns, denizens, and a system of government before Nintendo even shows off the now famous Princess Peach's Castle from Mario 64. And while they are making a game with Nintendo's toys, they are actively planning to switch to the competitor after which they even work to get other devs to do the same. Even if all of this was not a series of intentionally bad faith actions, which it seems pretty hard to accidentally burn bridges this thoroughly, it's unsurprising to imagine how unlikely it was for either company to ever revisit the brainchild born of their strongest features combined. After the way they split, it's no surprise that Nintendo, at least, would have no interest in revisiting one of the more amazing cult classics that was a result of allowing a once-trusted company to work on a highly valued and closely guarded franchise. It is unfathomable to imagine how much bad blood surrounded the previous gemstone of Super Mario RPG. Without almost anyone realizing it, it was a massive swan song to the very relationship between the two companies. This is the whole story, and why no one, not even the most hopeful of fans, ever thought that a revisit of Super Mario RPG would ever happen. It meant that both companies would need a deep amount of trust in one another again. And it couldn't be the type of trust that you make up for with well-written contracts and negotiations. Remember, Super Mario RPG was not the source of the bad blood. It was all the other actions happening at the same time. Things you couldn't write a contract to prevent. The prospect had become a true and complete pipe dream for 27 long years. Yet, here we are witnessing the unexpected and impossible. Ultimately, with a full-fledged remake of the game here, it likely, or at least hopefully, means the relationship between these two once-close studios is now truly mended. <laughs>